But without further ado, let's get to tonight's uh, subject, the beauty of American Midwest homes uh, pre-1940 in Sauk County. And this uh, started about 2019 or maybe 2020 um, with Carol Cradwell and uh, Eric Oxendorf. Carol is a artist and um, has a studio down on uh, Lake Wisconsin near Merrimack. She is uh, professionally trained, and if you know uh, Carol, she's just, just a wealth of creativity. And she was managing a gallery and wanted a new exhibit and um, met with me. And I had learned that Eric Oxendorf was then living in Baraboo and um, was quite stunned. I didn't bring his book along, but I had purchased a book probably in the 80s called Domes of America, where somebody went around, it was Eric, um, laying on the floor of every state capitol and building with a, with a dome and right in the center of it and taking a photograph of it. So I've got a little book called Domes of America and I couldn't believe that Eric Oxendorf was actually living um, in Baraboo a few years ago. So we all met and decided uh, that Eric would uh, volunteer to go around Sauk County and photograph um, historic homes. He is a, still is a professional uh, architectural industrial photographer. He's been all over the world um, photographing for um, every company you can imagine, Microsoft, Yamaha, 20th Century Fox, um, Harley Davidson, you name it. And uh, besides that book on Domes of America, he also did a, a coffee table book on the Milwaukee City Hall, if you know that building. So anyways, Eric uh, uh, traveled around Sauk County, took about 300 photographs, uh, made sure to try and leave uh, you know, leaflets with the homeowners so they didn't think he was stalking them or casing their house. Um, and then it came around uh, who's gonna pay for the framing and, and um, uh, easels and matting and, and printing of the photographs uh, for 30 photographs, 10 of which you see here tonight on the walls. So Eric, of course, had connections with the Wisconsin Architects Foundation, so they uh, provided a grant to pay for that. Uh, that foundation is a nonprofit organization um, of design and construction industry professionals dedicated to improving the quality of the built environment through research and education. And they have scholarship grants and um, a grant for, for programs like this. So they provided the funds and um, we of course provided the support in terms of my time on research and text writing for the exhibits and um, uh, taking the exhibit around to various places. Uh, this is kind of the last stop for the exhibit. It's been about three years. It's been down to the state capitol. It's been uh, several other places in the county. So I think after, uh, after it comes down here at the library, I think these are all gonna literally find their home at the house uh, uh, given to the homeowners of each of these houses. So let's uh, start, there's 30 homes. And again, there's plenty of other homes that could be included. It just kind of came down to um, some of that, that the, best, the best photographs and we wanted kind of a mix. There's tons of Queen Anne homes. We could have done 40 Queen Anne homes in Sauk County, but we wanted to cover a range of styles. So we're gonna go uh, kind of chronologically. And uh, the oldest one in the exhibit is the House of Seven Gables uh, called that built in 1860 uh, for uh, Terrell Thomas, who was the, one of the founders of what is today Baraboo State Bank. It was one of the oldest banks in the, private banks in the state of Wisconsin uh, starting in 1857. And just three years after he got the bank going, he decided to have a new house built for himself. Um, we're pretty darn sure that it was designed by Colonel Stephen uh, Abelman, who started Rock Springs. He was a builder and designer, and he would have drawn on books like, uh, uh, or designs like Alexander Jackson Davis uh, did, who was a big promoter of Gothic architecture at the time. Kind of in that era, you could have either a classical home, the Greek Revival, white pillars, temple front, or if you wanted something different, you went to the other side, uh, which is the Gothic Revival, um, pointy, vertical, uh, lots of gingerbread, not necessarily symmetrical, and so this is a magnificent house uh, built literally on the edge of Baraboo in 1860 um, and uh, owned for more than uh, 60 years now by Ralph and Pam Cranick, 
who have uh, lovingly restored it. They bought it in 1966, still live there, still work on it, and the inside is an absolute uh, museum. This was included in a book that the State Historical Society put out uh, several years ago called uh, Wisconsin's Own 20 Remarkable Homes, um, uh, published in 2010. They chose just 20 homes from all across uh, Wisconsin. You think I had a hard time with Sauk County. They had a really hard time picking 20 homes. But this is such an, a, a great example of Carpenter Gothic that they chose it for that book. All right, next, and actually slightly newer, uh, the Wiedenkopf Cabin. Uh, this is out at Sky High Apple Orchard. If you've been out there, you'll see it down the hill. Built around 1865, of course, uh, log cabins were built from the beginning of white settlement in the 1840s until um, you know, the 1870s uh, as cheap, you know, often um, disposable architecture, but rare survivors like this and of course all of the buildings at the Pioneer Log Village are testament to the hundreds if not thousands of log cabins that were built in Sauk County. And this is one of the bigger ones. It is quite large in footprint and of course has a loft upstairs. Um, it, it was uh, built for John and Florentine Wiedenkopf, um, as again around 1865, for his family after they moved from Ohio. They had 12 children, so even as big as it looks, they still had, you know, it was pretty cozy in there. Um, there were additions added to the house, um, uh, substantially altering the log, care, log core, but a later owner removed those additions and restored the structure. So if you're at Sky High, take a chance to go down the hill and uh, peek in the windows um, there. And we'll bop all around the county here. So down in Prairie de Sac, uh, we have the Tilkey House, built in 1870, uh, architect unknown. This was built of locally quarried uh, limestone called dolomite. And if you look closely, it has uh, what they call the block and stack pattern, which is um, common down in the central and southern Sauk County area. Three, three masons went around building these houses and they developed this very unique uh, masonry style of large cut blocks and then between those smaller pieces that were squared off with mortar joints to look a little more uh, neat and finished. Um, and then this is a, a, an even rarer example where they were using pieces of white marble as well in the front of the house to create this rather uh, unique pattern. Uh, Reverend Tilke was a licensed preacher of the Evangelical Association of North America, but he also had a side business selling sewing machines and pump organs. Um, it said the walls of the house are nearly two feet thick, and uh, again, we talked about that block and stack pattern. And if you if you're, pay attention on your way to Madison on Highway 12, you will see uh, two or three houses this color with that same block and stack uh, design. Um, beyond that, it is an Italian style house. It has uh, those brackets under the eaves, and um, a lot of the, the block and stack houses are simple gabled L uh, forms of the front facing gable, but this one was a little more uh, fancy with uh, the Italian design. All right, next, back up in Baraboo, back to the Gothic Revival uh, theme, a very late example from 1871. <coughs> The J.J. Gattaker House um, in Baraboo. Uh, John Jacob Gattaker was born in Switzerland in 1826 and uh, was highly educated as a teacher of French, Italian, and mathematics before moving to the wilds of Sauk County. Um, just three years after moving here, he became the county clerk and moved to Baraboo. And in 1871, he had this uh, handsome house built for himself, his wife Magdalene, and their three children. Um, and later, after he died, his, uh, two of his daughters donated money. About 20 years after he died, they donated the money to put the clock on top of the courthouse with the bells, uh, which is this year being restored. So we will finally have a working uh, clock tower again on the top of the Sauk County Courthouse with the bells. The house did have a few uh, later modifications. The front entrance there and this large bay window uh, were later um, refinements to the style but uh, it largely looks the way it did when the Gattakers lived there. All right, our first one from Reedsburg, not too far away, the Harris House. Um, 
built around 1873. This one's been a little hard to pin down, Janet, until we get the newspapers digitized, and then, then we'll be able to just search them all instantly. Um, this is a rare, rare example of what we call the French Second Empire style. Now, if you took your, finger, you took your hand and, and just blocked out the uh, red roof, you would have a perfectly wonderful Italianate house. Uh, the brackets under the eaves, the blocky form, the arch windows, all Italianate. The minute you add that, that very interesting roof, which is called a mansard roof, you all of a sudden have a French Second Empire style house. Looking to what uh, was going on in France, uh, it was named after uh, an architect, architect named Mansard, and it provided this uh, more functional third floor space. Some people said it, they didn't tax it because it was an attic, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if that was true maybe in France, but, um, but they're very rare here because they are a little more technically challenging. They have flat roofs, flattish roofs on top, which can be fun. Um, but it sure adds uh, some drama to a house. Um, this is the largest uh, and best example of that style in Sauk County by far. We have some tiny two-story cottage examples in uh, Baraboo. Um, built around 1873 by local contractor William Dirks. Uh, it was sold shortly thereafter to the local, a local merchant and promoter named Abner Harris, which is why we call it the Harris House. Uh, Dirks was a German immigrant who settled in Reedsburg in 1866, um, and he may have designed the house, we're just not sure. And also another unique feature are the porthole window, uh, window dormers in the uh, roof, in the mansard roof. All right, another one from Reedsburg and just, just up the road here, the Seaver Cottage, um, built around 1875. Um, now the railroad came in 1872, on January 1st, 1872, the first train came into Reedsburg, and there was a huge population boom. Uh, Reedsburg grew uh, the greatest in those next eight years uh, when the village doubled in size from 1872 to 1880 when the next census was taken. Um, so a, a tremendous amount of activity, lots of uh, railroad employees. So this um, was the owner, uh, owned by the station agent, uh, Eugene F. Seaver, um, and he was there in 1880 and I believe about five years earlier in 1875, he built this little Gothic Revival style cottage. So we have the um, pointed, you know, fairly steep pitched roof, and then especially on the dormers on the front, those little finial posts that go all the way up and through uh, a nice touch of the Gothic Revival. So even the most you know, basic, humble little house could really be jazzed up uh, with a little bit of ornament. Now, of course, this house is sitting next to this guy, so um, I'm sure they weren't, although the Seaver Cottage was probably built first. Uh, this is the Hackett House, uh, built in 1878, designed and built by uh, Edward H. Hackett, who was a builder and architect, and again, all this influx of wealth from uh, the railroad uh, precipitated these uh, buildings. Um, and he was a new um, immigrant to Reedsburg in 1874. He was part owner of a sash, blinds, and doors factory, as well as a contractor and designer. So he began construction on this in 1877, and the local paper stated that it abounds in steeples. So they were referring to all the pointy bits that were sticking up. Um, now this is, this is technically kind of Gothic Revival, although we would call this High Victorian Gothic. It's a little later iteration of uh, Gothic Revival. So we have a beautiful, almost Italian at bay window in the front, but that steep pitched roof and the gingerbread and especially the, the tower roof uh, really speak to the Gothic Revival uh, verticality. All right, out in the countryside in the town of Freedom, we have a typical Sauk County uh, farmhouse. Not really a style. We would, we would classify this as a vernacular gabled L, um, the gable portion being the, the triangle on the front of the main portion of the house, an L, E-L-L, -L, meaning a wing, although it very nicely creates an L-shaped floor plan as well. Um, so we call it a gabled L, and gabled Ls could be as plain as B or add whatever uh, decoration you want to them. So here we have some, some Victorian gingerbread on the porch and up in the gables. We have a classical half moon window up in the attic. So it's a shame all of these wonderful 
stained glass windows or fancy windows were always in an attic where nobody could ever uh, see out of them. But um, this was built for Charles and William Wilhelmina Grosinski, uh, who were German immigrants to the United States around 1870, eventually settling in the town of Freedom. They had 13 children, um, and Charles uh, grew the farm to over 200 acres in size, so they were able to afford a nice, tidy little uh, farmhouse. Uh, back in uh, Baraboo, what, what style is this again? French Second Empire, largely French Second Empire because of that mansard roof. Again, if you took the roof off, uh, you'd have a nice little Italian house with the arch windows and the brackets under the eaves. Um, this is Baraboo's best example of a French Second Empire house, but it's only two stories. Um, it's a very unique um, front to it with kind of a classical feel and some uh, brackets there in the second story. So they were playing around with um, adding a few different uh, styles to this house. We do know that this one was designed by Joseph McVeigh, that was a local architect and builder in, Reeds, in Baraboo. We actually have the hand-drawn linen drawings for this house. Um, they still survive. And this was built for um, William Clark, who was a railroad engineer. And um, again, the railroad did as, just as much for Baraboo as it did for Reedsburg. And, um, uh, upper level railroad employees could afford houses like this. So um, this was a very commanding house. It's tiny inside and only has like four rooms on the main floor and a little little stairs that's enclosed uh, to go up to the back. But it is uh, absolutely commanding and charming from the outside. Um, okay, here's a perfect example. This is an Italian style house and often Italian style houses were upgraded to French Second Empire houses by taking the roof off and adding a mansard roof and creating a third uh, usable floor. It didn't happen here, however. This is the Waterbury House in Prairie de Sac, built in 1882, uh, when Alonzo Waterbury retired from farming out on the Sauk Prairie and moved into town. Um, all the Waterburys were from New York State with family roots in Nova Scotia and Connecticut. Um, so here, again, a classic example of an Italian style house, often very boxy, two stories, um, often brick, um, and the, the segmented arch windows, and of course the brackets under the eaves. So just a gorgeous uh, example of that style. And you notice some of these, I don't know if we've gotten to any winter shots yet, but um, Eric really wanted to capture some of these houses, not just in the summertime, but in different seasons. All right, on to our first uh, Queen Anne. Uh, the Queen Anne started to appear here in Sauk County around the 1880s and came to really full fruition in the 1890s and, and after. And this is the uh, Killian House in Baraboo, uh, Queen Anne from 1894. And it was built for blacksmith August Killian and his wife Amelia and their two daughters, Martha and Hattie. Um, and Killian, a successful blacksmith, was able to uh, have this built in 1894. It's absolutely uh, uh, preserved inside with the original wood staircase and even the outside just in immaculate condition. It's a different color now since this picture was taken. It has a new owner and it's got a completely different color scheme so you might not uh, recognize it from this photo but absolute uh, glorious front porch there with all kinds of uh, bric-a-brac and um, you can see how even a basic uh, shape of a house can be uh, augmented. Now the Queen Anne uh, style, um, more, was, more was better, so any surface that could be uh, ornamented uh, the better. So we see fish scale shingles up in the gables, um, again one of those beautiful stained glass multi-pane windows hiding up there in the attic doing nobody any good. Um, and, if you, and if you get close to these houses, even the, the eaves are open and all of the rafter tails are cut with scroll work. Um, just anywhere they could add ornament uh, they wanted to. Even the corner boards have a rounded detail uh, coming down that's been picked out in paint there. And we'll see more than a few Queen Anne's here. Uh, this is another one in uh, Baraboo, the Carpenter House. Uh, he was a railroad guy, but his last name was Carpenter. Also 1894, and um, we often don't know who the architects are, but in this case, we know that this one was designed by Madison Architects Gordon and Pontiac, so that was something to be um, kind of feather in his cap that you could uh, reach out and have a Madison Architect design 
this house for you. Charles Carpenter um, was a well-paid employee with the Chicago Northwestern Railroad. Um, this house was reported to have cost $4,000 in 1894. The average house was probably less than uh, 2000 The paper said it will be something entirely different from any style house in Baraboo, and that probably alludes to the tower. It is the only octagonal uh, Queen Anne tower in Baraboo. Another Queen Anne with a little bit of uh, stick style uh, thrown in. This one is a couple years later, 1896, built for George and C.B. Hill, um, who had come to the area from North Hampshire, New Hampshire, after the Civil War. Um, and Mr. George Hill worked a variety of jobs before becoming a successful livestock dealer. Um, and he built this house at a cost of $2,500 in 1896. And some of the great features are that second story balcony with the round, uh, half round portal. Um, and that front porch, which extends beyond the uh, right edge of the house um, to give a little more space and presence to it. Um, largely Queen Anne, I did mention the stick style. And if you look at the top, um, those crisscross uh, X's shapes up there and elsewhere in the house are um, a nod to the stick style. And also, What's that? Where is that? This is on Ash Street, just across from the yellow Ringling House. And again, this one's a different color as well because it has new owners. Another interesting feature on this one is the clipped uh, gable roof. That could have just been a front-facing gable, but they put that little, little clip on it to uh, give it a little more interest. Just down the street to the south, another uh, Queen Anne, the Halstead House from 1898. We know that this one was designed by local builder and architect Reuben McFarland uh, for Herbert Halstead, who was engaged in insurance and real estate. He was also Justice of the Peace for many years um, in Baraboo. And uh, the Queen Anne is so vast and so long lived that it can be broken down into sub-styles. Some of the earlier ones uh, have more gingerbread, but as time went on, we see more classical details creeping into uh, the Queen Anne lexicon. So here we have round classical columns instead of um, more turned uh, post, posts on the porch. On the side of the house, way in the back there, you can see an oval window with accentuated keystones and uh, even the half round window on the stairs there on the side. Um, another nod to um, colonial elements. Uh, up in the gables, where we see that top portion pushed out with no eaves at all and covered in fish scale shingles, that is um, uh, an element from the, what we call the shingle style, which is extremely rare, but uh, they were houses that were covered in shingles, patterned shingles, and oftentimes did not have any type of eave at all. Now, this house was, um, must have been a, it still is a show place, but uh, in 1899, Elle and Lou Ringling actually had a copy of this house built just a few blocks away where the Elle Ringling Mansion sits today. At, at that time in 1899, four of the Ringling brothers started purchasing property in town and building houses, and Alan Liu had an exact copy of this house built, um, and only four years later, they were like, nope, that's not gonna do anymore, so they had it moved around the corner uh, between the Methodist Church and the library, where it sat for uh, many years and used by other families, and that, that cleared the way for um, the big Al Ringling Mansion in town. Speaking of the Ringlings, we get to the Charles Ringling House in Baraboo, the yellow Ringling House, as everybody knows it. This one was built in 1900, right at those two years when four of the Ringling brothers built houses in town. It was designed by Ferry and Kloss of Milwaukee, and our museum, the Van Orden Mansion, was also built uh, or designed by Ferry and Kloss a few years later. Um, this was built for Charles Ringling. Uh, it was expanded over time, but largely the uh, the front with this is the way it looked originally. Um, and it was designed, built by the Eisenbergs uh, of Baraboo. They were the, the preferred builder in town and built just about everything for the Ringling Brothers, including a later mansion for Charles Ringling down in Sarasota, Florida, which cost like a million and a half dollars. This was only $9,000 in 1900. So they got richer, that's for sure. Um, of course, now the Ringling House bed and breakfast, so you can go tour it, or even better, stay there. Um, very successful, and you can see all of the beautiful 
uh, interiors there. And this is uh, getting away from the Queen Anne. Now we're into the colonial revival. So we see columns with um, uh, ionic capitals to them. We see a bit of symmetry even, the house, even though the house is not perfectly symmetrical. Um, the large uh, half round window up in the attic, that is the billiard room. So that, that window you can actually see from a usable space inside the house. Um, and of course the beautiful railings on top of the porch roof. All right, back here in um, Reedsburg, another late uh, Queen Anne. Um, the greenhouse, this was built for, believe it or not, a 72-year-old widow named Levina Green in 1902. Um, she was born Levina Reed in 1829. She was a cousin of this town's founder, David Reed, and married Joseph Green, who made a fortune uh, growing hops and later investing in the local willen mill and the bank. So after uh, her husband died in 1885, and their only child, unfortunately, in 1888, Levina poured herself into the construction of this new house. Now, it was designed by Carl C. Menes of Lodi. And um, if you go to Lodi, you will see several houses of this size and refinement uh, there, also designed by uh, Mr. Menes. And um, this shows the full mastery of the Queen Anne uh, style house and we were talking just before about how the colonial revival was creeping into that world and things were being mixed up. So here we have a beautiful colonial revival porch supported by uh, ionic columns with the railing on top and then you have this Queen Anne house behind it with this wonderful three-story round tower. Even the glass is curved in those uh, windows and um, just a beautiful house all around. Out in rural Sauk County, one of probably the nicest uh, Queen Anne rural farmhouse is the Ritchie's house out in the town of Troy, um, built around 1902. We think this is possibly a George uh, F. Barber design. George Barber was a pattern book architect. He, did, he designed, or his firm designed hundreds and hundreds of uh, pattern book houses that you could order the plans for. Not the kit, that was Sears, but this one you would order the plans and have somebody uh, build it for you. But uh, this is possibly a barber design out in uh, the rural Sauk County in the town of Troy. Um, John Ritchies was born in 1861. was a successful farmer with several hundred acres and six children in need of a large house, which he definitely got with this uh, construction. And again, uh, Queen Anne largely, but again, colonial uh, revival columns and up in the two gable attic uh, spaces there, a Palladian style window. And that is a arched central window flanked by two vertical uh, rectangular windows creating a Palladian uh, arch effect. Houses all over. Uh, this is uh, the Haas house in Plain. We would call this a vernacular house again, a, a um, kind of everyday house. Um, so there's no addressing a style to it, although it does have a few Queen Anne features like the stained glass windows and a little bit of the decoration over the top. But you can see how even a fairly modest plain house can be uh, extremely pleasing to the eye with the right proportions. Um, this one was built, um, we believe in 1904 for John J. Haas, who owned a saloon in Plain. And in 1912, the house was purchased by Philip and Elizabeth Bettinger, um, who used it uh, to host traveling salesmen and entertainers. And I think now or in the past, it has been a bed and breakfast uh, as well. So continuing that tradition. Uh, back in Baraboo, uh, the Roser Cottage um, from 1906. Uh, this was built for, again, another retiring farmer moving into town, Fred Roser, who moved into Baraboo with his wife, Mary, and uh, had this built. This house cost $2,600 to have constructed. And again, we see the Queen Anne uh, fish scale shingles, patterned shingles up in the gables, a little bit of gingerbread up there at the top, and a nice little uh, front porch. The um, Rosers did not have any children, so when they died, they left the house to their nephew, Charles Leonard Roser, uh, who moved in with his wife. They did some interior remodeling and updating, um, but the outside stayed pretty much the same. Uh, 
Something completely different appeared just a couple years later and a few blocks away in Baraboo in 1910. This is the Schultz House um, built in 1910 for William and Lou Jean Schultz, and this was $4,000. It is a wood-framed house with a stucco-clad exterior, and this was actually designed by the Radford Architectural Company in Riverside, Illinois. William Radford was another pattern book uh, architect. And we didn't, we didn't know who designed this house until one day I was paging through the Baraboo papers and I saw an ad for the American home by William Radford and in the masthead of the ad is this house as a little drawing, although it's reversed. It's completely backwards. We have not been able to find the plans for it. He has his, um, plenty of his catalogs are online digitized, but we have not been able to find the exact plan for this house. But he published over 20 catalogs of designs beginning in 1903 all the way into the 1920s. And he did employ licensed architects to produce uh, plans for his firm. So we would call this um, arts and crafts. If you've heard of the craftsman style and craftsman bungalows and all that, this is kind of a, a cousin to that and even a precursor. The arts and crafts style uh, started in England as a, uh, a response and revolt to all the industrial mass production of things and it was trying to get back to handmade products and beauty and aesthetics and um, it bled over into architecture and um, ultimately all the bungalows that you see around are part of that uh, movement but this is uh, a little bit different a little earlier more English with these two-story bay windows and these tall uh, casement windows a few other features, um, including the open rafters and whatnot. Just up the street here, uh, the Perry House in Reedsburg, uh, neoclassical in style, built in 1910. And uh, fairly recently, um, the new owners found the plans for this house. So we now know that it was designed by Len Hoots and Guthrie of Milwaukee and built for Ralph and Henry Perry. Ralph was uh, an educated attorney and uh, also district attorney. He also became involved with the woolen mill here as well as a president of a local bank. So that's what financed this house. Um, so absolutely grand uh, location and grand house, neoclassical in style with um, two-story uh, pillars on the front uh, in front of a balcony uh, porch behind that and uh, just lots of lovely features inside. It's, it's hard, you can't tell it from this picture, but that little greenhouse or solarium on the right uh, is in front of the dining room, and they've actually have a skylight against the house where, where that one story meets the two-story part of the house. There is a two-foot skylight that lights the entrance to the solarium and provides light into the dining room, which would otherwise be in the dark. Yeah, yeah, some, yeah, Magnolia. exactly, Magnolia. yeah, yeah, for a long time we thought it might be the Magnolia, but now we know it's a it's, uh, Milwaukee firm that designed it, but if you can imagine, Sears was selling a house just about this size as a kit home, so, um, yeah, for $5,000, yeah, this one probably costs like ten. so, of course, had room for uh, a live-in maid on the, the third floor, it has five bedrooms, um, and all lovely features inside. Now, tied into that craftsman movement we were talking about is the Prairie uh, School, and uh, this is the Porter Residence in uh, Baraboo, built in 1911. So you can see these wildly different styles from the Perry House here to something like this in Baraboo, built in 1911 for Walworth and Ellen Porter for $5,000. Uh, Walworth was a Civil War veteran and um, even though his wife and Ellen and he were both over 70 at the time of the construction, they still spent several years uh, in this house. He died in 1924 and she in 1929. Um, little, little story about it. After they died, it went to their only daughter, Cornelia, and she had married uh, Reverend Richard Rowley, who was an Episcopal minister. They had no children and a fair amount of money, and I'm not sure if it all came from... Um, her side of the family, or I can't imagine it was his job as an Episcopal minister, but uh, she loved to buy things, and this house was absolutely full of new merchandise when she died, to the point that they had to have a 
backyard, sit on the porch steps night and day so that nobody looted this house before they could dispose of the estate. Uh, she was so bad, she would go downtown, buy things, and leave it at the store, saying, I will come back to pick it up. Um, and there was warehouses beyond this house full of uh, merchandise. So anyways, <laughs> as a, if, if all these walls could talk, right? Um, beautiful uh, example of the prairie school, long, uh, elongated horizontally, the broad eaves, um, ribbon windows, especially in the dormer there. Um, and just a beautiful house, unfortunately, right on busy uh, 8th Street in Baraboo, but uh, Eric didn't want to just do all of the very, very glamorous houses. Uh, every house has a history and has some uh, charm to it. This is uh, the Platt residence in Baraboo, 1911, so same, same era as the one we just saw. We would call this um, probably an American Foursquare with Colonial Revival detailing. The American Foursquare were, was more about the form of the house. These would be two-story cube houses, uh, very functional in terms of, or practical in terms of the amount of space that could be had inside of the least amount of exterior walls. And then you could add whatever kind of ornament you wanted. So it has some Colonial Revival uh, details with the columns there on the front porch. August Platt uh, decided to build this house in 1911. Uh, it was built by the Eisenberg brothers, so great builders, and um, had a spacious layout. They had an extended family that lived here, so it is quite uh, deep in the back. Um, in 1920, census lists August and Augusta living there with three of their children who were young adults along with a brother-in-law and a niece. Um, August Platt was a successful ice dealer in Baraboo, and this, this sits just north of the Baraboo River there, so he was very familiar with going down and getting ice cut out of the uh, river. Uh, next door to the Schultz house that we saw, that other stucco house just a few slides back, is the French house named uh, for Herbert French and his wife Mary Louise, um, built in 1912. Uh, this we would call a craftsman style house, so it's basically a gigantic bungalow. Um, and uh, Mary Louise French, his wife, was Mary Louise Van Orden. So she lived in the house just across the street, the Van Orden Mansion, which is now the Sauk County Historical Museum. And after she got married, uh, the French has built this house just across from her parents and probably used Ferry and Kloss, the same architects uh, from Milwaukee. We're, we haven't been able to verify that yet. But uh, if you know the Van Orden Mansion, it's got those very heavy eave or uh, verge boards on the front of the eaves. Um, as you see on that right side, kind of protruding uh, gable. Um, Herbert French uh, had uh, Reedsburg roots here, uh, but eventually moved to Baraboo where he became a city engineer um, and uh, married Mary Louise Van Orden, the, the banker's daughter. All right. Out in the countryside in the town of uh, Prairie de Sac, the Gruber House, built in 1912. Um, cement block uh, construction became a thing in the early 20th century. I believe the Presbyterian Church here is a cement block uh, construction. And cement block companies or cement block making companies would often sell cement block forms and other equipment to farmers so they could make pattern cement blocks in their off time, if there ever was any, if there ever was such a thing, in the winter time maybe, and uh, make, make pattern blocks for people, if not themselves. So it may have happened here, we're not sure, uh, but it was built for Christian Gruber in 1912. And so we have um, a couple different styles of pattern block. The main part of the house, just a simple block with a beveled edge. But if you look down at the foundation, especially on the porch, uh, in the columns there, you see a rock-faced um, cement block. And if you look closely, you can always see the same pattern. Sometimes they'll turn the block over to try and uh, make it a little more mixed up, but um, it was all cement block. I believe the columns here as well are also cement. So a very sturdy house. And then, well, one last thing to note is the metal fish scale shingle roof, which is quite uncommon. Um, if you keep that painted, it will last forever, um, but you don't see too many of those uh, anymore as well. 
Uh, back up in Baraboo, we jumped to around 1925. Um, we had that craftsman thing going on, and the counterpoint to that, just like between the colonial revival or the Greek revival and the, and the, the picturesque Gothic revival, was the Tudor revival. And that looked back to England for um, inspiration. And here we have a very simple example of a Tudor revival style house from the 20s. Uh, built for Madame de Sautel and her son Francis. Um, he worked for the Chicago Northwestern Railroad. And very sparingly adorned, but really the hallmark is that front entry with that roof. And they call that a cat slide roof. <laughs> Sometimes they're even curved and they come quite low to the ground and create that picturesque effect on the front of the house. So it didn't take much to um, ornament a house like that and make it something a little more special. Just a few blocks away is the McFetridge Mansion, one of the um, more costly homes built uh, in Sauk County for its day, 1928. Um, designed by Frank Riley, a Madison architect. He's quite well known in Madison. We have four or five uh, Frank Riley houses in uh, Baraboo. We'll show you another one of a completely different style. But here Frank Riley is working in the Tudor Revival. Uh, style, a very substantial house for Edward and Nell McFetridge, and the History Center that I showed you right off the bat, which is our archives and offices, that is the office building for the Island Woolen Mill, which was the largest employer in Sauk County, and Edward and his brother William were the owners of that uh, after their father died. So uh, Ed had quite a house built in Baraboo up on the hill, looking towards the southeast, uh, and uh, if you know the governor's mansion in Maple Bluff, that is also a Frank Riley design, although not at the time that this was built. It was a private residence at that time. Um, and said that stone from uh, one of Baraboo's old bridge abutments was set into the chimney of this house, kind of hiding there in the back. Uh, in, inside the home is said to feature a dining room fireplace, which was reported to be an exact copy of one found in the English home of Rudyard Kipling. Um, it is a very uh, a house built for show. It's only one room deep and it's very elongated. So to get from the living room on the far left side, you have to go through the uh, foyer, through the dining room, all the way to the kitchen on the other side of the house. So it was definitely built uh, to have a prominent uh, facade. What was the cost? This I don't know on this one. Um, I'm sure it was... I wouldn't even hazard a guess, but in the, in the five figures for sure. Uh, as a point of reference, Al Ringling's mansion, which did not make the exhibit, uh, but the big sandstone mansion was 35000 in 1905. So this was probably, by the 20s, you know, 50, 60, 70,000 maybe. It is a very substantial house. It's all built of cement and steel, so the floors are... Uh, cement, which is a good thing because the garage that's tucked under the far right side of the house had a car fire not too many years ago and it would have destroyed the whole house had the ceiling not been uh, solid cement. Just down the hill, and a winter shot here, is the Kinsler House in Baraboo. This one was built around 1931. Um, and again, kind of a mix of uh, Tudor revival. We see the very steep roofs and a few colonial revival elements like the front door surround and that little uh, symmetrical window above it. Um, this one was built for uh, Henry and Adler, Addie Kinsler around 1931. He was the owner of the Gem City Dairy uh, in Baraboo. And he also had some tourist uh, cabins near Oxner Park. There is another one of these houses in Baraboo, so we haven't been able to figure out what pattern book they probably came out of, but it was, uh, it was uh, definitely reproduced elsewhere. Now we're just talking about Frank Lar Riley with the McFetridge uh, mansion. This is another Frank Riley house in a completely different style, the Colonial Revival style done in 1933 for Harold and Catherine Langer and their growing family. Harold Langer was an attorney uh, in Baraboo and after he married Catherine Hickey, who I presume came from outside of Reedsburg here uh, with the Hickey family. Um, commissioned uh, Frank Riley of Madison to design this new house, probably not wanting to you know, copy the McFetridges, so they had a colonial revival house 
uh, designed by him instead with uh, Georgian and Adam style adaptations. Um, it is, Frank Riley houses are just wonderfully designed inside and out, thinking of every little nuance and feature uh, imaginable. Um, hope to uh, someday get this on a tour of home so people can see inside, but it has a very elegant staircase and well-proportioned rooms and uh, fireplaces. All right, our last one for tonight, if you've been counting, number 30, is the Hill House in Baraboo. Again, another uh, Tudor revival from 19, around 1935, uh, designed um, for Robert and Bertha Hill. Um, he was a mining engineer, and that took him to all parts of the world, which is maybe why the stone in the chimney uh, was chosen. Um, but he was also an electrician operating his own shop. Now, the architect is unknown, but somebody's got their Sears mail order book here. This, this looks identical to the Stratford model in the Sears mail order kit home book, uh, which came out in, the Stratford came out in 1929. Um, we haven't been able to 100% uh, prove it. I'm not sure how many of the Sears homes were brick, because uh, that would have been really heavy and expensive to uh, ship as part of the kit but it looks exactly like the Stratford uh, design from uh, Sears and Roebuck. So that took us, what, about uh, 70 years of uh, style from uh, it's the House of Seven Gables, which is literally about three blocks from this house, all the way to uh, the 19, late 1930s and uh, the Tudor Revival style, which of course is related to the Gothic Revival style with the steep roofs and a few other features. So.